Okay, so you just go ahead and start by saying your name and spelling it for us. Yeah, Jamie Bartholomus, J-A-M-I-E-B-A-R-T-H-O-L-O-M-A-U-S. Okay, so we'll start with our introduction. Um, today is Tuesday, May 15th, 2018, and we're at Foothills Brewing in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm Richard Cox, talking today with Jamie Bartholomus, president as part of the Well-Crafted North Carolina Project. So um, we'll start asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I was born up north. Uh, grew up in New York. Was born in New York. Lived in Delaware and Pennsylvania until I went to the University of Georgia, uh, '92 to '96, and I started brewing beer in 1993 while I was down there in college. Um, within at, towards the beginning of '94, I started uh, working at a brewery in Athens, Blind Man Ale. So that was kind of my beginning of my professional mm -hmm. career and um, you know I got a degree in anthropology there did some archaeology for a while and then kind of shifted more towards beer making you know working in breweries and you know doing the actual brewing mm -hmm. for many years That's awesome and how did you first become interested in the brewing industry um, you know taking anthropology classes is uh, just talking about all different kinds of culture and you know I was young and enjoyed drinking beer so uh, some, some of my friends and I uh, uh, bought a book uh, Complete Joy of Homebrewing mm -hmm. uh, from Todd Papazian and read it over the summer after my first year of college and kind of when we came back the second year we all kind of pitched in an apartment and pitched in and uh, bought some brewing equipment. And How long did that? kind of got going. That was in 93. Well, okay. Yeah. And then uh, the guy who sold me homebrew supplies Became the brewmaster at the first at Blind Man at the first brewery in Athens, and uh, so it wasn't long after I started working with him there. And what brought you to North Carolina then? Uh, after school, I moved up to uh, near Asheville in Back Cave, North Carolina, and uh, really just I wanted to get to North Carolina. Um, you know, I heard a lot of good things about Asheville. This is 1997, and um, thought I would try to land a brewing job there. Uh, the archaeology I was doing. With archaeology, you kind of go where the work is, so it didn't really matter where I lived. We were working in Fayetteville. Uh, the company I worked for was out of Athens, but we were working in Fayetteville, North Carolina. So, you know, it was fine for me to live in North Carolina. I was working at a brewery in Columbia, South Carolina. And w anyway, we were doing like nine days on, five days off in the archaeology, and basically on the days off, I would go down and make beer mm -hmm. uh, at Vista Brewing in, in Columbia. So. Awesome. And so, moving on to Foothills, what, what led you to open Foothills, and to, or what uh, led up to Foothills? I was working at Old Hickory Brewery in, North Cal in, in Hickory, North Carolina for about four and a half years, and uh, you know, I wanted to, I had a feeling like I wanted to grow a brand and make my own brand, and I uh, heard of some people who were thinking about opening something in Winston. Uh, there was an a old uh, defunct publication called Brewpub Magazine years ago. And I think they had an article like top 10 towns open a brew pub in. And Winston was in that article, you know, it was probably from like 1995 or something like that. And uh, Winston was in there as the right size kind of demographic and, um, uh, you know, population, education, uh, certain things that kind of hit the, the target for uh, craft beer back then anyway. Mm -hmm. so. And so that was 2004? When you uh, yeah, we actually opened. We were established in '04. We actually opened in '05. Mm -hmm. uh, we intended to open in '04, but you know, had a little delays. Our um, our our contractor went bankrupt on our job. He uh, he was doing a lot of um, downtown restaurants at the time. There was a, a restaurant row. Um, th there was some uh, public funding, or city funding, uh, restaurant row program the loan program and uh, in that and he had done a lot of the projects that were on that so um, and a couple of them never paid him so uh, he ended up he was trying to catch up on our job for you know the other subs and all our subs just stopped showing up and we're like where are they and it was a whole mess we were trying to pay them instead of him and uh, yeah, that was definitely some Cause some delays for us because you know we had to basically pay the subs every week for them to keep coming back. So mm. it was that was a, definitely a one of the challenges we had opening. So. You have any other major challenges while you're opening? Uh, well, just the renovation of a 
uh, old building in 1928 is when the back part of the building was built and I think 30 and sometime in the 30s the front part of the building which was steel construction was built and um, it was just a really old really beat up building and it was, it was a lot of rehab a lot of unexpected things we kind of bumped into uh, and you know our architect lives out of town so we never really came to the building between that and the contractor going out of, uh, going bankrupt it, it was it was tough yeah mm-hmm. we had to end up um, double paying most of the subs to uh, because they didn't get the money from the contractor so we had to they all had liens on our building and you know we had an SBA funding so we couldn't couldn't finalize that funding until we took care of all these liens that the subs had put on the building so we had to end up basically double paying for a lot of the work uh, so those are some initial challenges that you know we didn't for a little while I didn't know we were going to get open yeah. <laughs> uh, SBA was a small business so yeah small okay. business administration we had uh, money from the uh, downtown foundation the uh, city of Winston-Salem we had a small amount of money and uh, Bank of North Carolina was our original lender mm-hmm. yeah and pick choosing downtown was that's where the restaurants were or uh, well, there weren't hardly any restaurants right. downtown back then. It was uh, it was really about availability of buildings, and yeah, I mean, back then and still now, brew pubs tend to go in downtown locations where uh, you know, and a lot of them have been part of revitalization programs in downtown areas where there's either money offered or there's sidewalk improvements or you know things of that nature that tend to bring early businesses mm-hmm. down to the downtown area. You know, when we open. Uh, Bistro 420 was downtown, Cat's Corner, downtown Delhi, and that, that was really about it. It was just a couple of small little places. Um, then right around the same time we opened Six and Vine, which opened, which was, a, was another big step kind of up on, it was the first thing up on Trade Street mm-hmm. to really open. Wow. So. And um, so what do you see as the main mission or theme of Foothills? Um, so we serve the community. Um, and keep people happy. You know, we have a saying um, that in one of our, you know, I, our IPA projects, craft, craft happiness. And that's, I think, something that uh, is kind of an underlying mission in what we do is, you know, obviously we're making beer, but uh, it's really about uh, bringing people together, uh, tying community in, and, um, just keep people happy, you know. Um, as you know, well, I was at a brew pub, we serve food and uh, all sorts of stuff there, and it's, it's just really about being a meeting place and um, uh, being a connect, a social kind of connector mm-hmm. with people. Mm-hmm. And well, like you mentioned, um, community support is a focus at Foothill. So, can you talk a little bit more about what the Craft Happiness Project, IPA project is, and any other types of fundraising or awareness building work that you've done? Yeah, we've been doing, um, this is our fifth year doing a um, quote of the month series, uh, where we're basically doing a different beer every month, different IPA every month. And uh, it showcases uh, all kinds of experimental hops and just gives our, some of our brewers some freedom to, uh, and our brewmaster freedom to uh, we get to try new things, to brew new things, and uh, we tie it in with the community by uh, picking a cause of some sort uh, that we may want to support and um, just uh, donating some money to that cause and just bringing awareness more than anything. Uh, you know, um, you know, nonprofits and to various causes have um, their own kind of outreach program, but uh, as a brewery, we have a unique. Uh, opportunity to reach the public because people just enjoy beer and enjoy reading about it so uh, by highlighting various you know b- various cause various calls and nonprofits we're able to uh, shine extra light on on, the, on those uh, whether it's a local nonprofit or you know a regional one or sure whatever, so. and, and talking about the brew pub for a second um, how do you go about looking to find a balance between the the food and the beer insofar as the focus? Um, but the brew pub, well, we're breweries, so there's always a focus on beer. But uh, for longevity, 
you really need to have uh, the focus be on food. Uh, when we first opened, we were much more of a bar and less of a restaurant. And as a result, most of our business was on Friday and Saturday night. And we kind of realized early on that that wasn't going to be the key to success. Uh, I was just remembering yesterday, back in 2009, it was a really cold and snowy winter. And um, we had like four weekends in a row of, like on Friday, it snowed. And it was kind of a realization to me that we really needed to develop the rest of the week, you know, in our business so that we had more, more business on a day-to-day -day basis instead of just bar business. So we really made a concerted effort to drive focus to the food and to the restaurant uh, more and, and really have since. I mean, the, again, the beer's there and we're a brewery and you can't, there's no escaping it. But, uh, you know, bars are fickle, or they can be. And restaurants can be fickle too, but less so. So uh, by, by um, catering to, you know, we have, a, you know, kids night, you know, where we have like discounts on kids food and that kind of stuff. It's anything we can do to bring in family kind of, we, we want a lot of family atmosphere and families come on a day-to-day -day basis. We want them to feel welcome with the children. And many of the people who work here are younger. We have, there's a lot of young kids running around uh, both of our places. And uh, we want to, you know, the customers to feel, feel the same way, feel welcome bringing their children or anyone. You know, so. And Fertile has expanded its production capacity multiple times. Can you talk a bit about this process and how you see this as important to Foothills and the craft brewing industry? Um, when we opened, we, we, were self, we just started selling at our brew pub. And then we started selling draft only out in the marketplace. And we self-distributed. And we were able to expand several times in the brew pub. Uh, we used to joke that we were beating that building into the ground. Uh, and it kind of uh, culminated in, you know, we about drove a forklift into the basement because the floor collapsed <laughs> in a small part. So we ended up filling the basement in over there with concrete so that wouldn't happen again. <laughs> didn't, the, the forklift didn't fall in. It's just one of the wheels kind of poked through the, wall, the floor. But um, we, um, yeah, we were able to expand as much as we could over there and then we had to build this place on Kimmel Drive where we are now. Um, it was kind of a huge leap of faith for us and kind of our, our, our brand. You know, we had gotten to about 7,500 barrels at the brew pub uh, and then we think we could uh, feasibly do up to about 200,000 barrels in this building. Mm -hmm. So and when we moved here we were doing 7,000 barrels. So it was a pretty empty building back then and we opened basically beginning of 2012 we started brewing. And um, so, in, you know, we're now seven, how many years? How many years is that? Five years. Uh, this is our sixth year uh, here. So, and we've definitely filled it in over time. We did just under 41,000 barrels last year. So, uh, we've had a series of expansions here. Um, it's kind of a just necessary thing as we grow. It was our goal when we opened to be a regional brand. And, you know, we think that's what we are. We're in, uh, six states around the southeast and um, we were one of the you know we were the 19th brewery to open in the state so now there's about 270 so a lot of change regarding that but mm -hmm. uh, when we opened there wasn't that much going on in this state and but you know they popped the cap the same year we opened and that uh, brought a lot of increased awareness to craft beer because it was really just a law change and um, a lot of people, it was in the news a lot, so there was a lot of awareness about that, and it really kind of helped jumpstart the craft beer industry here in the state. So, you know, we had many years of um, really large growth, just draft only, really, in North Carolina. Uh, there just weren't that many brands here. So uh, now with two, you know, 260, 270 breweries, definitely uh, more challenging out in the marketplace than it was when, when we were first getting going. Yeah. And in 2000, 2017, Foothills partnered with Bookmarks, a local literary nonprofit, to create the Cafe Footnote. Um, how did that partnership come about? Um, I read about it. So, well, let me back up. They, um, the building next to us has changed ownership a couple times, and a few the original people were going to, you know, uh, 
rehab the, some of the short buildings, and it just never happened until the most recent owner, uh, when they bought basically the whole rest of the block past us. And they've basically renovated almost all the spaces now. Um, you know, Texas Pete or Garner Foods is up in the upper area, um, and a bunch of other small little, little businesses in the downstairs area. The building in the back, you know, we, we, the various investor groups that looked at the property, we had talked to a lot of them about maybe putting in a restaurant or something. Face was a little too big, and we had we while we were talking to them, we found out that Bud Marsh was going to go in. They decided to take half that space. So um, I read an art, just kind of read an article about it in the local paper. And I reached out to Ginger, who's the executive director of Bud Marks. Um, just she had mentioned something about wanting to have a little, co- little cafe or coffee shop in the article. And you know, my wife and I have been roasting coffee for about 14 years, and we had bought the commercial roaster out of uh, Brew Nerds, which is over here of Haynes Mall Road, and it's just been sitting here. For, we've had, I've owned it for three and a half years now. So I kind of called her up. I said, "Oh, I'm excited to hear about your project. You know, do you want a, a coffee roaster to put in? The, you know, if you're going to have a coffee shop, do you want to roast coffee in there or something like that? You know?" And she's like, "Oh, funny. I was going to call you to see if." Foothills wanted to maybe run the coffee shop in our space, and we didn't think a coffee shop in the bookstore might work out that well because we have to be open only when they work. But we worked it out so we're kind of right next to it, so it's kind of a nice symbiotic relationship. When they're open, we have big doors open, and people can kind of come in and out between the bookstore and the coffee shop. And um, when they're closed, you know, we just close the doors, lock the doors, and so no one go in the bookstore. And you know th- we were doing a lot of events in the in the foot in foot a place called Footnote. We were doing a lot of private parties and anniversaries and wedding rehearsal dinners and me- lunch meetings, that kind of stuff. That's mainly what the space is for. It's right next to our brew pub. We we poked a hole through the wall and expanded our kitchen so that we're able to service larger parties over there. It was something we were never able to do in our um, restaurant. We, it's very important to us to stay open at a restaurant so our regular customers it will always be available to them. So we've always turned down larger parties because we're just not able to accommodate. So this gives us the opportunity to really serve us up to about 230 pers- people in that space. So um, it's like three different areas or spaces where we can kind of accommodate people there. So it was just a, you know, a nice symbiotic relationship with the bookstore. Um, and they wanted a coffee shop. We wanted to open an event space, and we needed a bar area anyway. So it just kind of worked worked out. Nice. So we're happy. We're happy. It's uh, awesome. it's happening. So. Awesome. Um, Foothills has always had beautiful label art. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of interesting and distinctive label art? Um, promotional art. Uh, I suppose. Uh, yeah, the company uh, Shapiro Walker Design was a company here in town that was a graphic design firm. Now they've merged with another company called Elephant in the Room. Um, as the guys who I, we originally worked kind of uh, step back, they're a little bit older. Dave Shapiro, they're kind of maybe retiring or semi-retiring next few years. Um, it was a, a Kyle Webster was the artist of all our la- for all our labels. He used to work at Shapiro Walker. Since he's gone out on his own and been a very successful uh, digital brush business, which he sold to Adobe, but he still does our. So he works for Adobe full time, but he still does our our art. Um, you know, David Shapiro at Elf in the Room, uh, and their whole team has been instrumental with. You know, there's a lot more that goes into it than just the actual art. It's the design of the package, the bottle label, the six pack how it's portrayed, uh, you know, whether it's in digital format or on paper. And we've worked with David and the team over there since the beginning uh, on, they really preach uh, consistency and recognize, uh, kind of focus on recognizable, recognizability, is that a word? Uh, it is now. And so we've kind of kept that train of thought uh, always as we design new stuff just to make sure, does it look like Foothills? Is it uh, easily recognizable as, as one of our brands? And it's, you know, good beer is um, kind of the ante in this business. You have to have good or great beer, but you also have to have a good business plan, has to look attractive, 
and you, you have to have people that can actually sell it. So there's more than just great beer that goes into it. Uh, it has to be a full package. And we think the art and, and graphic design is, is part of that. One big event each year with a bit of a cult following is your release event for Sexual Chocolate. How did that event develop? <coughs> um, after Pop the Cap happened, we were allowed to make stronger beers. And all the breweries were. So we, um, it, it opened up a, a whole variety of styles that we were not allowed to make legally in the state that all of a sudden we could make. So like our brewery, like a lot of others, you know, started delving into some higher alcohol beers and Imperial Stout is a style that's typically higher alcohol. So we just, um, Central Chocolate was a beer that I made back in college as a homebrew for Valentine's Day. It was a beer we put chocolate in it and just, it was well received from our friends. So we thought it would be fun just to, you know, bring it out uh, commercial scale. And the first year we just did a draft only and it was very well received. It was, <coughs> there weren't a lot of Imperial Stouts. There was, most of them that were in the state were maybe from other st breweries in other states, but there were very few that were made in North Carolina. So it was kind of exciting for a lot of the people who were really into beer to just have a homegrown Imperial Stout. And, um, you know, sort of a provocative name and label. So it was, people were interested in what, we're, what it was and what kind of what we were doing. Um, to the tune that a lot of, you know, we were getting a lot of emails about trying to get bottles and trying to bottle 12 ounce bottles off of growlers, and, which is, you know, if you know anything about growlers, it's not the ideal way to fill bottles. So we started thinking, well, man, we'll do it next year, you know, we'll bottle a little bit next year. So, um, so we did, we did like 500 bottles, but, you know, they're all hand bottled and capped and hand labeled, hand numbered, and um, it was well received, and we've kind of just slowly kind of grown it every, a little bit every year since then, trying to maintain, um, you know, kind of the feel of what we did initially. I mean, I, I believe, if not the very first, it was certainly one of the first bottle releases in the Southeast. You know, there was there was only five breweries in the country doing bottle releases or something like that, or, the, you know, that were well known at the time, and very few. Now there's three or four a weekend in North Carolina. So it's a whole nother, uh, the, the, the beer industry is much different now than it was then. Mm -hmm. It was a very uh, unusual and exciting thing back then. So. And how long was it before you started? Because you have a bourbon, uh, a bourbon barrel aged version as well. How long we started doing that a couple years after um, the regular version. We just had access to some barrels. We were first, like many things in this industry, there, there was not a lot of barrel aging going on back then. And we thought it would be fun to call up, uh, you know, Buffalo Trace Distillery and see. We we felt we were able to get some 23 year old Pappy Van Winkle barrels. Which is, uh, if anyone knows anything about bourbon, it's a very rare and exciting bourbon. You know, I think in 20 years rated like the best bourbon in the world or something like that. Um, and back then it was like you just you can basically have your pick of what kind of barrels you can get. So great beer sought after in conjunction with a great bourbon uh, barrel, so to speak, that was uh, highly sought after, made for just a, uh, a great combination of, uh, of beer and uh, certainly a great flavor. Uh, nowadays, we don't get, we don't we're not able to get the happy barrels much anymore. Uh, Buffalo Trace has started doing a lot of the, of other liquors besides bur just straight bourbon. They're doing a lot of like corn whiskeys and that kind of stuff. Where you know, bourbon, you only have to use a barrel, a virgin oak barrel, one time. So they've started reusing a lot of their own barrels, as well as sending a lot of them to Scotland for uh, Scotch. Is often in, in bourbon barrels, they, uh, it's done, so, uh, the availability in general of the like, select kinds of bourbon barrels is, is uh, much less than it used to be. We're still, we still have great good luck getting great barrel, barrels, it's just not the, the rareness that it used to be. Right. Um, in early 2018, Foothill started production of three of Natty Green's core brands. How did that come about? Um, you know, I've been friends with the owners of Natty Greens for a long time. Since, since we both, you know, we opened with him 
eight months of each other or so. And yeah, we we both had our, our growth tra tra trajectory, so to speak. And um, if you had asked each of us back in 2010, you know, there was a lot, still many, a whole lot less worries back then. And I think our expectations for growth were different than they are now. We've certainly tempered our uh, growth at expectations uh, with 270 breweries in the market versus eight, you know 18 to 20. Uh, so well, both of us always talked about you know putting in these grand having these grand plans of building these huge breweries with 100 barrel Rolex systems. And Rolex is a fancy automated German system that uh, you know not that many breweries have, and it's very expensive. And I, I used to say to Chris Lester over there at Natty Greens often, you know, we probably both don't need 100 barrel Rolex. You know, that, the chances that there's going to be two breweries of that size in the triad, it's probably pretty slim. And we've said that to each other over the years, uh, you know, and um, as, you know, plans change, they're building a, maybe building a new brewery and moving out of their brewery and uh, de de emphasizing the production and more focusing on, on retail. Uh, yeah, they just kind of came to me one day and said, You know, we've always talked about how we both don't need all this equipment. You know, maybe you'd make beer for us and we would, you know, refocus on some more seasonal or specialty brands. And since we have a large facility uh, and we're, you know, I've been brewing for in the brewing industry for 25 years now, I think. I think those guys came to the realization that they prefer the restaurateur side or the retail side to production and um, large scale production is very uh, capital intensive and um, it takes a lot of focus on numbers and inventory and not nearly as exciting as retail but it's you know it's important too. It's something that I always had planned to try to do and you know want to continue so we're happy to uh, to start doing it. We've only put out four or five batches for that. It's only been the last couple of months that we started, but uh, it's going well, and they seem to be happy, and it's going to help them streamline some operations. It helps us be more efficient with our equipment and labor and everything. So, um, you know, it's just it just made sense from a shared services perspective, mm -hmm. um, and as uh, competition gets more fierce out there, so to speak. Um, efficiency and profitability is key out there. You gotta better make money. It's no longer is it just open a brewery and you know there's a lot of people who think they're gonna get rich opening a brewery in a year. The reality is that you know that's that does not happen very often. So it takes hard work and time and patience and you want to have a utilization rate of your equipment as high as possible because that's how you are profitable ultimately. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and you were quoted once as saying that, that partnership represents the future of craft beer. What did you mean by that? Well, just what I just said. Yeah. Really, shared services and, um, uh, and efficiency. That, that's the kind of thing that people are willing to embrace. Uh, the fact that they have to run a business first, uh, even if it is their passion, it has to be profitable and to stay open. Um, I think a lot of a lot of newcomers have more passion than uh, is probably good for them <laughs> because at the end of the day you have to you know your expectations and business plan have to be aligned with reality and um, so yeah that's that's what I meant by that I think uh, craft brewers tend to have too much pride and it, it makes sense they're very you know we're prideful people we make a product that we're trying to sell to people we have to believe in it to for others to believe in it, but uh, there's a tendency to want like a monument or shrine to um, to your brand when maybe it makes more sense for uh, equipment to be cross utilized with several brands in the long run. Again, I think that's the kind of thing that we're going to see more and more of as breweries teaming up, um, and you, so equipment can be utilized more. You know, for a long time. The, our national association, the Brewers Association, said, "Well, what's holding the craft beer back is capital, access to capital. And there's not enough capital coming into the business. 
Now it's uh, business flooded with capital, but what you're seeing is all this equipment that's utilized at a 10% rate or very little, and you cannot make money like that. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of uh, rationalization of, of expenditures in the next few years. And um, the, there will definitely be some people who hold on to their pride too much. They might, you know, they might not, may not um, be around. Right, right. Um, some of the state and local laws, which you've already touched upon, um, were in place when you first opened, have been repeat, repealed or changed, but others have not. Um, how do you see legislation impacting Foothills and the brewing industry in North Carolina over the course of your time in the business? Um, I've been part of our Brewers Guild pretty much since the inception. I, I helped start it back in uh, 08, um, and then I'm now president of the board again. And um, you know, legislation is a and uh, and the ABC rules is a big part of our focus for our guild. Mm -hmm. uh, last year we passed a fairly large brewers bill, with ten pieces in it, and uh, got attached to the brunch bill. Uh, one of the most important pieces of that was, in my opinion, was the uh, quality assurance piece, which basically allowed all labs, brewery labs, to do sensory work. Um, you know, ABC law is you're not allowed to drink uh, any alcohol when you're on the clock, but a lab people cannot do their work job, which is a large part of the quality control, is sensory. They can't do that while on the clock, so they changed the law so that is that is now allowed. Um, and that was a very important piece because basically every single brewery was breaking that law, including Miller when it was open, the Slitz Brewery here in. Uh, in Winston, you know, in the North Carolina, if it's not expressly permitted, it's prohibited. So, a lot of stuff that may have been inferred as legal, or but if it's not specifically stated, then it's not legal. So, a lot of the stuff that we're, we're our guild is trying to help change focuses on that as clarification of the law or stuff where um, items where. There might be gray areas and it's open interpretation. We're trying to help with the interpretation so there's more spelled out. Because now there's with so many breweries and so many different plans, different business plans, the, the laws are being pushed and pulled in every direction, tested. And in a lot of cases, this is not clear there's something that's legal or illegal. And um, so obviously that's not a that's not a good plan for businesses trying to make their way. You know, you, you want to stay within the law, obviously. So, um, but sometimes things come up that never come up before, just mm -hmm. because the sheer number of breweries and events and opportunities to sell beer out there uh, as they've grown. Um, that's one of our big focuses. Is um, that, you know, honestly, the laws are pretty darn good in North Carolina. It's one of the reasons why. There's more breweries in this state than any state in the southeast. You know, our guild slogan is the state of southern beer. You know, and we really think it is. It has the most favorable laws of any state in the southeast. Uh, now that doesn't mean that there aren't additional things that can be clarified or, um, I don't want to use the word fixed, but, you know, mainly about clarification or corrected or based on antiquated ideas. Um, you know, like the, um, well, the brunch bill is a good thing. I mean, it was, it was about blue laws. Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in the population that might want to have a drink before 12. So as the law, as the state and population, dis, you know, kind of attitude has changed, it makes sense the laws are changed to, to match that. So. Yeah. And how do you see Foothills growing in the future? And what challenges are you facing today? We're really, uh, we continue to double down in North Carolina. That's where most of our sales are, and we think most of our sales will continue to be. Um, we just opened an additional retail location that helps kind of uh, strengthen and broaden our brand. Uh, you know, we're roasting coffee. It's not a huge uh, uh, revenue driver for us, but it's really a broadening of our, our brand and awareness, you know, for our coffee shop kind of, um, doing our own coffee there, so to speak, and 
Um, really, it's just continue focus where we are, the markets where we are, North Carolina especially, and potentially some more retail in the future in some other parts of North Carolina. But um, you know that that's you know we're really kind of just um, stick it, staying put here in North Carolina and just trying to make a difference here where we are. So. And how has the brewing scene changed since you first went into the business? Um, there wasn't internet when I first went into business. There wasn't really cell phones, and there were maybe 800 breweries in the country. So there was a much more collaborative spirit, and there still is, but back then it was a much more collaborative spirit because there were so few people working in the industry get gathering information about beer or equipment or vendors was very difficult. You know, there wasn't, you couldn't just hop on Google and, um, you know, and find 19 people to send you, sell you grain. It was, there was, you know, one place, two places. That was about it. And just find, finding information. I mean, when you wanted to call a brewer, most places were brew pubs back then. It's like you had to call and talk to the hostess at lunch. Is the brewer in? You know, can I, can I talk to him? And that was the only way you could, like, get in touch with people because they weren't cell phones really uh, not in the brewing industry anyway um, and it, it was it was a we're all in this together kind of spirit and I'd like to think I hold that spirit to this day because of my history in the industry uh, there's a lot of new entrants coming in that are not from the service industry or from the manufacturing industry software or advertising uh, lawyers, doctors, anyone who has a pile of money and likes beer it might be getting into the beer industry these days and um, you know not, not to well, bash certain population groups but I've read something on there's a, a beer blog kind of a famous guy that comes out every day and uh, he tells us about well he was talking about millennials but you can really say anyone from another industry that doesn't necessarily have that collaborative spirit of food of the food industry sometimes, mm -hmm. like in a software company or something like that. And that those people come in the industry in conjunction with a lot of the um, the domestic brewers sales teams, like uh, the Bud Miller Coors, a lot of their regional managers or people coming from their distributor groups who have money and have very aggressive sales tactics. And those people coming together with People who maybe weren't in this industry are is now becoming the industry is becoming a lot more competitive, a lot less cooperative, and um, a lot more protectionist, frankly. And um, so, you know, my every day goes about to combat those feelings, whether it's through the guild or outreach with small brewers, and uh, as far as giving advice or just trying to help. Um, you know, it's very important that we all stick together. Because we're not only fighting, we're fighting against each other from business in the marketplace. We're competing against the big breweries and domestic breweries. Um, we're competing against wine, spirits, and uh, all kinds of other non-alcoholic beverages too. Frankly, so uh, you know we need breweries need to stick together and really work to lift the, you know, the in, our industry. And by being cooperative and collaborative. Is that we have a much better chance of doing that as opposed to infighting. So, you know, anyway, that's a lot. A lot my, my focus in the guild uh, focuses a lot on bringing people together. And, uh, you know, legislative is a necessary part of it. But frankly, legislative uh, issues tend to divide people more than they bring them together. So, you know, for instance, in states like New Jersey, um, Colorado a few years ago, uh, I think it's. Um, is it Idaho, where there's actually some uh, two state guilds, there's secondary guilds forming uh, in this state, and a lot of states are local alliances, which are more like regional marketing groups. But as these groups find their way, they're, they're finding that sometimes there's conflict with state guilds. And, you know, the Brewers Association only recognizes one guild per state. So it's critical that, that these groups stick together. Yeah. Um, and certainly the, the legislative bodies do not want to hear from multiple groups from the same industry. In fact, they don't even want to hear from 
um, brewers and distributors, they, you know, they want to hear as one voice. So um, a big thing we're doing is we're really trying to work hard along with the distributors to, um, to have a more collaborative voice. You know, a more unified voice is the word I should use. So that when we go to the legislature, it's we've already hashed out any disagreements. We we've go to them with a a plan that everybody's already agreement with, and a lot better chance to get something done. Um, <clears throat> tying into that, where do you see the brewing industry in the next five years? Uh, <clears throat> you know, there's still like 60 breweries in North Carolina that are in planning. Whether they're all open or not, I don't know. Uh, in general, there's a move to neighborhood and uber local places. It's basically like a small bar. The breweries are, you know, like our tasting room here. We only sell beer, basically. We have a little tiny bit of wine, but uh, it's mainly just a beer bar. And I see more and more of that. Again, we, we may consider some additional retail locations across the state in the future. I see a lot of that. I see a lot of breweries going out of business. Right now, there's a lot of turnover where breweries may decide they don't want to be open anymore, but people are moving immediately in into the old brewery. Mm -hmm. Seeing that all across the country, but in North Carolina, in the past 12 to 18 months, I think I'd say at least 10 breweries have turned over. And you might not hear about it because the place it may keep the same name, or it's just a new brewery that opened in old in a in a brewery that decided not to stay open. So I think there's going to be a lot more turnover first time there's a recession, all the capital coming in, there's going to be, there's going to be capital calls out the wazoo, I think, and, uh, from banks and lenders. And I think we'll see uh, breweries who did not align their growth, expect, you know, the growth plan with uh, the reality of what's in the marketplace. I think those, some of those places will close. Uh, people who and again, embrace shared services and working together. I think we'll do better as opposed to people who want trying to build monuments, to, you know, to the brands. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> so no, yeah. talking about brewers guilds and alliances for a minute, um, you've been incredibly involved with the North Carolina Craft Brewers Guild, the Tri Brewers Alliance, and other professional organizations associations in the industry. Uh, what do you see as the benefits of these types of organizations? For me, it's kind of uh, giving back. You know, I've been in the industry a long time, and I want to make sure that people who decide to come in the industry have information, education, so that they're doing the best job they can. I've helped people with different breweries, with business plans, design plans, um, real estate, looking to real estate with people. You know, anything I can just to help people set them up for success. Uh, I feel a calling to do that, shall we say. I just feel like, a, a, since I have been doing it for a long time, I've seen a lot of good and bad. Bur you know, yeah. breweries, uh, breweries do well, breweries fail. I've worked with good and bad ones. And, um, you know, I think I have insight that I can share. Um, and, you know, it, um, I'm, Although I'm pretty easy going, I'm also pretty opinionated, so I, I want to help shape what's going on in the, our industry and in our state. Um, so by being part of these, these groups, I have the opportunity to do that. Okay. Um, what is your favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery other than your own? Uh, whatever IPA is on draft and fresh. Okay. That's, uh, for me, draft beer is uh, mm -hmm. the best. You know, I think a lot of people would agree as opposed to a package and uh, wherever I am, I, I just look for you know, uh, new stuff I haven't had uh, and hopefully it's good and fresh. I think that's uh, similar to a lot of people in this industry. You know, they say craft drinkers aren't very brand loyal. They're, they're loyal to craft, but they're not necessarily loyal to any one brewery. So it, it makes it a lot more difficult to build brand loyalty because craft drinkers or or people who uh, eat gourmet food or any kind of beverage, I think in general, seek out quality, even if it's not the brand they're used to. So I, I think it's not just craft brewers, it's anyone who enjoys gourmet, I think is a word that a lot of people use to 
you know, just higher quality things in general. They wanted a kind of connection with the people who make the stuff. And that's what I joke, it's our inefficiency as a, as a craft brewer is what people are attracted to, right? We employ a hundred times as many people per barrel as like a, as Anheuser-Busch. You know, they have a, th like, uh, I think a rule of thumb is like one person per 100,000 barrels. Where in a brewery our size, it'd be like one person per 1,000 barrels. But it would support a lot of families. And, you know, so a lot of people know, if, know someone, even if they don't know someone who owns a brewery, they know someone who works at one. And it's the stories and the families that uh, grow as the business grows. And that's, I think, what people are attracted to. Uh, in the industry, and going back to your question, how am I, uh, <laughs> I don't know, yeah, whatever's fresh on tap is what I like. What would, you, what would you say Foothill's flagship beer is? A Hoppy is by far our flagship beer, yeah. it's over half our sales, uh, it is the number two six pack in North Carolina, in the grocery stores, um, so definitely, definitely Hoppy. Mm -hmm. uh, but what is your favorite beer from Foothill's? It's probably Hoffman. That's what I drink um, more often than not. You know, I drink all of our beers, but I tend to gravitate back towards that one. Okay. Um, we did just roll out a couple of new beers, uh, uh, a Thousand Smiles Gold Nail and Tangle Vine Berry Rosé. Is We we um, retired a couple of beers uh, that were kind of a similar style. Uh, they were brands we purchased along with our brewing equipment in this place. And um, we're discontinuing those and kind of reimagining those beers uh, as, as the new ones. Bring them more into the foothills fold. They didn't have our artwork on them. As a result, they weren't easily identifiable as foothill brands. And um, so anyway, um, these are brands that don't really fit into, the, the, excuse me, they fit in much better to our portfolio. You know, we tend to be, IPA heavy, so by having you know a lighter beer, um, you know kind of a fruit beer, uh, and also our amber malt shaker amber is a new beer we just uh, came out with in the past year. You know, there's, these are styles that we don't really play in that much, so we just feel like it's a broadening of our portfolio. But by far, Hopium is is our big beer. So. Awesome. And do you have anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. <laughs> Thanks for your time. So, all right, great. Great. Yeah, Thank you. Do it. Yeah. Thank you very much.